Imagine if that cycle is completely reversed, if you had an 80 degree heat source and a 40 degree heat sink. Imagine a power plant that does not burn fuel, chase the sun, or wait for the wind, but literally breathes electricity out of the sea. Picture a deep ocean machine that inhales warm water, exhales cold water, and turns that silent movement into non-stop power. No smoke, no chimneys, no pores, just a giant metal lung resting in the waves. It sounds like science fiction, yet engineers are building it right now. In this video, we will dive into how this strange idea began, why it almost disappeared, why it is coming back, and what hidden risks it carries today. Imagine an energy plant so powerful that for the same patch of sea, it can make up to six times more electricity than solar panels or wind turbines. Yet it can do this while running every hour of every day. That is the idea behind Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, or OTEC, a deep sea power station that turns the ocean into a slow breathing battery. Early Hawaiian researchers who built one of the first modern prototypes noticed something striking. The warm water near the surface and the cold water far below behave like the positive and negative ends of a giant battery. Their plant pulled in warm surface water, took some of its heat to make power, and sent cold water back down. It worked like a mechanical lung. Warm water in, energy out. Cold water back to the deep. Experts now estimate that OTEC could, in theory, supply around 90,000 terawatt hours of electricity every year, enough to power the whole of Europe almost seven times over. It sounds like science fiction, but the idea is about 150 years old. In the 1870s, a French physicist named Jacques d'Arsonval measured how much sunlight the oceans absorb and calculated that the world's seas take in more than a million terawatt hours of solar energy every single day. Human energy use back then was tiny. D'Arsonval realized that if we could tap even a small fraction of that heat, our energy problems could vanish overnight. The problem was how to build a machine that could pull this heat out and turn it into electricity. D'Arsonval watched the sun warm the water. He saw that the ocean is not the same from top to bottom. In the tropics, the surface can reach 35 degrees Celsius or more. Down at depths of 1,000 to 4,000 meters, the water stays around 4 or 5 degrees. Warm water is lighter than cold water, so these layers rarely mix. That leaves a steady temperature gap between the surface and the deep, a natural battery. Dassonval realized this temperature difference was exactly what a special kind of heat engine needs. In 1881, he proposed the first design for an ocean thermal power plant. It used what we now call a Clausius Rankine heat cycle. You can picture it as a heat pump laid horizontally inside the sea. Large pipes form a closed loop filled with a working fluid like ammonia. Warm surface water passes through a heat exchanger and boils the fluid into vapor. Steam drives a turbine, which makes electricity. Then, cold deep water cools the vapor in another exchanger, turning it back into liquid so it can flow to the start and repeat the loop. It used no fuel, only sun warmed. One of D'Arsonval's most determined students was engineer Georges Claude. Claude did not stop at theory. He refined the design and built the first working OTEC prototype. Tests suggested the system might even be profitable. Investors approved a full scale. In 1930, the plant rose on the coast of Matanzas, Cuba. By modern standards, it was tiny, producing about 22 kilowatts. But for people who watched electricity flow from warm seawater, it felt miraculous. This living laboratory proved oceans could power generators day and night. Then the ocean struck back. During commissioning, a powerful hurricane crashed into the Cuban coast and tore the young plant apart. Claude tried again in 1935 with a second plant in Brazil. Again, a violent storm wrecked the facility. Two back-to-back -back disasters wiped out the first true OTEC stations. To some, it felt almost cursed. Modern engineers offer a calmer explanation. 90 years ago, people did not have corrosion-resistant alloys, advanced coatings, or computer models to design seawater heat exchangers able to survive huge storms. The technology was simply not mature. Even so, it is easy to imagine that some supporters of oil and coal were quietly relieved when the experiments failed. 
In the 1960s and 1970s, inventors tried again to resurrect ocean thermal power. New designs were drawn, and work began on improved plants. For a short time, momentum grew. Then the global oil market crashed, and fossil fuel prices fell to record lows. On paper, OTEC still looked attractive. In practice, it was no longer profitable. Money shifted back to cheap oil, and many ambitious projects were abandoned halfway through construction. A few small pilot schemes in the United States made it to the water, as backup during oil crises. None went fully commercial. By the time Darson Val and Claude died, both men believed their ocean energy dream would never see the light of day. Fast forward to 2025, and the tables have turned. The same idea is now hailed as one of the most promising ways to make steady, low-carbon electricity. Ocean thermal energy conversion is back, this time with better materials, and a world that urgently needs clean base load power. Hawaii, long a hub for ocean research, has just brought a modern OTEC plant online. Earlier small tests ran there decades ago, giving the islands a head start. The new facility is essentially an upgraded version of that old Cuban concept, rebuilt with 21st century engineering. Stronger metals resist rust, smarter control systems keep the plant stable in rough seas. And Hawaii is not alone. Around the globe, universities and big companies are racing to harness this power. At TU Delft in the Netherlands, researchers have published studies on how huge OTEC's potential could be. They are modeling floating platforms, new heat exchanger designs, and layouts that squeeze maximum power from the temperature gap. Advances in materials science mean old problems like salt corrosion and biofouling are easier to manage. Engineers expect longer lifetimes for pipes, pumps, and exchangers. At the same time, experience from offshore oil and wind has helped cut construction costs. Put it together, and modern OTEC plants could, in theory, deliver electricity at roughly 3 to 15 US cents per kilowatt hour. The cost is in line with some of the cheapest wind and solar projects. But OTEC adds a key advantage. It runs 24-7 constant output, is a treasure for factories, data centers, and island grids that need reliable power. As long as the temperature difference in the sea remains, the turbines can keep turning without waiting for sunrise or the wind. Big industrial players are taking notice. Japanese shipping giant Mitsui OSK lines, often shortened to MOL, have made OTEC a top priority. Working with research partners, they are building a demonstration plant near Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Their goal is to switch on the world's largest OTEC power station by 2026, delivering steady megawatts of energy from warm surface water and cold depths. Japan is not alone. Companies in the United States and the United Kingdom are developing their own projects. A British firm called Global OTEC is teaming up with Hawa Hawaii-based AI Ocean Engineering's to refine the technology. In the past, American and British navies studied OTEC as a way to power remote bases far from fuel supplies. Civilian governments in tropical regions, from Caribbean islands to Pacific nations, see it as a path to energy independence. All these projects rely on the same rule. The greater the temperature difference between surface and deep water, the more power each plant can make. Tropical and equatorial oceans offer the best conditions. In many places, nature has already done half the work. Engineers only have to tap the gradient. But when a technology sounds this good, it is wise to ask what the catch might be. OTEC supporters argue that deep cold water pumped to the surface stays clean after it passes through the plant. It can be used to cool buildings and replace energy-hungry air conditioning. Its nutrients can feed fish farms and support aquaculture. In theory, you get a triple benefit – electricity, cooling, and nutrient-rich. Skeptics warn the ocean is a finely balanced system. Pumping cold, nutrient-rich water into the sunlit layer could trigger big plankton blooms and sudden jumps in fish numbers. That might look good for short-term fishing, but on a large scale, the effects are unclear and could even nudge local currents or weather. Most scientists think that small OTEC plants will not slow large flows like the Gulf Stream. Still, they admit that filling whole regions with these systems would push us into new territory. 
Deep water nutrients are meant to stay locked away. If we lift them on a huge scale, we may reshape food chains. We might see more fish, or we might see harmful algal blooms that block light, steal oxygen, and suffocate coral reefs. No one yet knows what will happen at very large scales. Careful testing and prolonged monitoring will be essential. What is clear is that OTEC is so promising that many experts believe the risks are worth exploring, as long as we expand slowly and pay close attention to what the ocean tells us. For now, ocean thermal energy conversion is a dazzling but still uncertain opportunity. It could become the quiet engine that powers island nations and coastal cities without smoke, fuel, or constant mining. Or it could reveal side effects in the sea that force us to slow down. Either way, the giant battery hidden in the oceans is finally being wired up, and a story that began in the 1870s is getting a second chance.